Welcome, Kim. Tell me about yourself. Uh, hi, Matt. It's nice to meet you. Um, I'm a physical therapist and I've had cancer three times in the past few years. And I've had a lot of experiences running the gamut from wonderful to not so much. And um, recently, physician well-being has become my life's purpose. Okay, thank you. And why does physician well-being matter? Well, to me personally, um, I have seen um, the results of burnout um, personally for myself being a physical therapist and then the toll it takes on physicians because I've uh, had a lot of doctor appointments in the last few years and I was concerned about um, my doctors and uh, I just feel that it's very important for the physicians to be able to be engaged to provide good quality of care to their patients and we have to take care of the doctors so they can take care of us. Okay. So I like that. So there's a, a kind of a two two way traffic there that, that, you know, of course, we all know that it's important for doctors, physicians to be to be well and to be healthy. But actually, that in turn means that they then provide really high quality patient care because they are well and well and healthy, because if you're burnt out, you, you don't provide that good quality care. Exactly. Um, and. I know that you you worked in healthcare settings, so you know an awful lot and you've observed, you know, you're not the physician, so you've observed kind of a little, not quite from the outside, but also not quite from the inside. Um, and you've seen the other side um, as a patient. And from your perspective, what would you say are the common reasons that burnout happens? Well, I know for myself, which I can relate, and it seems to be the things that I hear from physicians as well, is a loss of autonomy um, and frustrations with electronic um, medical record I and also a moral injury. And I believe that's different from burnout. And I feel like I understand the difference uh, between the two as well. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about loss of autonomy and moral injury? Sure. So when I um, was working um, in my last, uh, a couple jobs ago, that was during the period that we switched to the EMR. And that's when I feel like things changed and got worse. And there was a time when I would walk into work and I would be able to say how long, uh, when I evaluated a patient, uh, how long their session should be and how long I estimated that need therapy. So one day I walked in and my schedule was already made for me with like how long I should see each patient. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, you don't tell me how long I'm going to see the patients I tell you, right? <laughs> but that wasn't the way it was anymore. And sadly, it also um, related to insurance. So if you had somebody that was around my age that was on Medicaid and had a knee replacement, you were only allowed to see them for 30 minutes. But you could have a woman in her like 70s, 80s or 90s with COPD on oxygen and they were put on your schedule for an hour and 15 minutes um, because they had good insurance. Okay. And so that's so so I could see as far as now as it's the same thing with the doctors that they don't have control over their own schedule and it's very frustrating. Yeah. OK, um, I mean, what do you think are the solutions? <laughs> well, some pe some doctors are having success going to like direct primary care or concierge. Um, you know, medicine where the patients are paying them directly and they seem to be very happy doing that. So that could be part of the solution, but for patients that are complicated, such as myself, that can't be the full answer because I could never afford to pay all those doctors, you know, because now I have a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a surgical oncologist, you know, a gynecologist, an endocrinologist, a nephrologist. And so you can't, you know, that's just, that's the short list, right? And, um, so I think there just needs to be, you know, drastic changes in the healthcare system, but also I would know that you would say that even like universal health care, because some people think in America, well, we should be going to universal health care. But then you all struggle in 
uh, similar ways where your patients might be waiting for a year or so, right? And we have some people, like some people might think we should be modeling our system after Canada, but then sometimes you have people from Canada coming to America so they don't have to wait two years for a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, no system's perfect. Yeah. What, what about um, individuals? I mean, it would be lovely, of course, if you and I could fix the system. Um, and that's, um, I think that's, that's my tomorrow's job, I think, but, but sort of for today, um, maybe what, what can, what can we as individuals do? Well, I'm actually trying to figure that out myself, uh, you know, for, as, as one person. So also I want to support physicians. So I'm trying to figure out how locally, if you're not working within the healthcare system, how can you support your local physicians? So a couple of things I'm, um, I'm thinking about doing is we have a local cancer center and I was thinking of giving a talk like there or our library, um, places like that to just raise awareness because the, a lot of people just have no idea how difficult things are for doctors. They think they're, you know, walking around doing their doctor thing <laughs> and, uh, you know, being happy and doing well. And they just really don't have any understanding. So I think if, if you can raise community awareness, um, because a lot of, you know, patients are upset when they show up and, uh, you know, their doctor's looking at their computer and they don't understand uh, that even after they go home, all uh, the time they're spending reviewing lab work and uh, that they have to answer all the portal messages and still do the, um, you know, more charting and things like that, that there isn't an understanding. So I think if you raise awareness, then, the if you've got commu a groundswell of community support for physicians and you let the then the hospital system knows that the patients care that that might make a little bit of a difference so and if i could find something that i can actually do that makes it help and i've also been um a big advocate of writing doctor's thank you notes and i started during you know my own after my own procedures and everything and there have been people who have told me um, that because of me that they have written thank you notes to their own doctors. And I know sometimes there, and even not doctors, there's been other healthcare professionals that have written a thank you note and one told me it like made her whole month, you know? So it really can make a difference. So even those little things um, to just raise awareness about. So that would be like what I think feel like an individual could try to do locally. And if that could be replicated, it would be great. Then there's more, again, system changes, and we have to figure all that out. So I'm um, collaborating with Medicine Forward. Are you familiar with that group? Okay, so that's, um, yeah, it was a group started um, about four years ago, and they had a town hall about, I think at least 30 people showed up on Zoom a couple weeks ago, and I just had another meeting with some of them this morning. And we're trying to figure out again, the things that can be done to try to move the needle um, and things like um, amplifying uh, our voices, meaning physician voices, um, uh, you know, pat, there's power in numbers, just connecting to connectivity, uh, sharing resources, uh, decreasing repetitive efforts, things like that. Yeah. So this is, this is fascinating because I was, I was expecting that we were going to talk about what what we can do ourselves, but this is great to hear that actually, I mean, patients can help us. And I, I suppose we, we all want the same things, you know, health, healthy doctors make good doctors and patients want good doctors. So, so actually, when you put it like that, we all want the same thing. The patients want the healthy doctors and we want to be healthy and we want to do, to do a good job. So um, yes, I mean, in the, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the days when people brought in um, wine even, <laughs> sort of, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm old enough to remember those days and, and chocolate. Um, and yes, yeah, sort of, it, it's, it's not that common that sort of that one gets even a thank you card, certainly not in UK, or maybe maybe it's just me, sort of perhaps everybody else gets lots of thank you cards. But, but yeah, but it, it, it's interesting to think that that, um, that that patients can help. And in some ways, almost a, a reversal of hierarchy, because typically we think, you know, as, as doctors, we are patient advocates. So we have the power and we advocate mm -hmm. for the patient. Whereas what you're saying is the patient has the, the power and the patient advocates for us. So that's quite nice mm -hmm. also. 
Yeah, and I think that we have to work together. And I think that was because Medicine Forward was initially a physician only organization. Uh, they're just starting to realize that uh, they can't do it alone, you know, that you almost need patients to help. And we all have to care, you know, even if we want legislative changes, that's it's going to be raising awareness for the issues on a very broad um, basis and getting the politicians in who would support the things that you think are important. So we can't just, you, if you just take uh, only the doctors go to the voting booth, that's not going to get you very far. Yeah. So, so I know that um, I, I do have um, non-doctors listening. So, so I think the, the top tip for the non-doctors is every now and then um, do a thank you card for, for, for your healthcare professionals um, that are looking after your social care or social services, whatever. Whoever in the public sector is looking after you every now and then, it's good to say thank you and write them a card. And you're right, sort of those kind of things, they go a really, really long way, don't they? Those, those little thank yeah, you. Yeah, actually, and that's what the doctors have shared with me, yes. <laughs> so I know that, that you talk to lots of doctors and you've written lots of articles um, and in terms of what what can doctors as individuals, what can we as individuals do for ourselves, for our own well-being? Well, a lot of it from what I'm, uh, you know, hearing them talk about, like in residency training, how they were um, all primed to, you know, put the patient first and even to hold back on their own self-care needs as far as, you know, eating and sleeping and going to the bathroom and you, they just get in their heads that the patient comes first and that these basic, that you have to take care of your own basic needs. Make sure that you have time to eat, you know, make sure that you have time to sleep, make sure that, you know, you have time to go to the bathroom, like that you shouldn't be holding back on those basic needs. Um, and that's that's the start and it's just time with family is important now i know some physicians will say well when you know like because of the uh demands um and that's also where myself that i see that coaching can come in because i think when you're in a position of burnout or when you're depressed you can't think clearly and you don't see options and you would think well look it's the system that's the problem i have no control over this but we all have more control than we think and sometimes it takes like a coach or a mentor or a therapist or somebody that's not you to um reflect back to you um some things that you actually do have control over and I feel like that's an important point because when I, I started, I had stumbled across Kevin MD a year ago, March. And I was started reading about that's when I became concerned about my doctors. There was all the statistics about, you know, 400 physicians a year die of suicide and, and they were talking about burnout. There were all these doctors and a lot of it. So I saw it was the first time I really saw a coaching reference, but I at first was thinking, well, why should my doctors have to pay for a coach um, when it's the system that's a problem? Like I could see that it was the healthcare system. I mean, my poor doctor shouldn't have to pay money, right? So then comes last December. And as you know, now I have my own physician coach, you know, Michael Hirsch, right? So once I ended up as, as luck or fortune or whatever would have it, and I did end up being coached that all of a sudden I did a 180 and I could see the value, like how he helped me process and think about some things that had happened to me over the past few years that I had, you know, one view of it, but he could help me see other things. And then I was, I went from thinking, well, nobody should have to pay for a coach to, well, everybody needs a coach, you know, because everybody has things in their own life that's happened that it would be helpful to have someone else to reflect it with. And, and it, um, especially if you've gotten certified in coaching, like you've taken the training and you know how to do it and the questions to ask, and it's not giving advice or telling anybody what to do. It's asking the right questions so you can open up your own mind so I feel like for some physicians that that could be just really important to have someone they can trust because it's totally confidential. And even if they don't want to pay, you know, there's, I don't know um, if if the resources in the U.S. would also be for U.K. physicians or if you have your own resources, but there's a number in the U.S. and I made a whole page of um, free and confidential resources for physicians that they could try first. 
-hmm. and then if they wanted to to continue on um you know to coaching and why is it so difficult to recognize what's in, in what is in our power well i think that you like people just get stuck in the day to day because i think of my doctors, if you walk in and you're expected to see patients, you know, every 15 minutes, and then you have to do all the lab work and you have all the administrative tasks and you think all this has to be done. And you would think uh, as far as setting bound, I think sometimes it comes down to setting boundaries and you might not think that you have power to set any boundaries, that some of these things are expected and demanded of you. But everyone personally can set their own boundaries uh, to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said that that it's really valuable to have somebody else to talk to um, and somebody to reflect with. So I'm wondering what what can we do for our colleagues? So when I go to work or when you go to work, you know, what can we do for our colleagues to help them? Um, well, hopefully be a good listener. And I know our local healthcare system during the pandemic started something called PACT. Uh, I believe it's for like peer associate care teams. And they were training clinicians to check in on each other. So they trained some people to become almost like trained listeners. And interestingly enough, it hadn't quite made its way up much to physicians, though it was very helpful with other clinicians. So whether the physicians thought, I don't have time for that, that doesn't apply to me, but it absolutely does. Um, so just uh, just caring and saying like, you know, because when you say, oh, hi, how are you, right? Or, or how are you doing or something like that, right? The, everybody thinks they're supposed to just say, oh, I'm fine. But sometimes I know even for myself, like when I was going through my health struggles and you'd see somebody in the grocery store parking lot, at, like from church, and they'd say, oh, how are you? And I'd say, fine. And every so often somebody would say, no, how are you really? And that just opened it up because sometimes like I wasn't in the best place. Mm -hmm. And when they actually, when they said that, then you knew that they were engaged and had the time and interest to listen and they really did care. So even asking a second time or in a different way um, can really make a difference. So it's it's giving people permission to talk and making it clear that, that, that we're open for a discussion, that we do care, that we are there to listen. Um, and, and yeah, and giving, giving people permission to actually talk and to offload. Yeah, no, I like that. Okay, um, and then my final question, what would be your top tips for doctors at work? Okay, so um, you, so you, as you know, you are part of that um, article, the Kevin MD article, uh, Reigniting After Burnout, Three Physician Stories. And I, I just love that. I thought the three of you um, did a wonderful job. And um, you did that article also with Sue McClellan Tolbert and with Michael Hirsch. Um, so I thought it would be helpful if I shared their takeaways because they are also uh, physicians and coaches as well. So uh, Sue McClellan Tolbert's takeaways, um, she said, for those interested in coaching or becoming a coach, immerse yourself in this space, embrace vulnerability, learn, trust, network, step out of your comfort zone, and always remember your innate wholeness, creativity, and resourcefulness. And uh, Michael Hirsch said, uh, never stop learning, evolving, or challenging the stories you tell yourself about yourself. His favorite self-inquiry is, is that even true? You'd be astounded by what you can learn about yourself through this simple question. And another takeaway is if you don't do something different, nothing will change. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Kim.